Good morning and welcome to ATARC StepSecOps Reducing Risk and Scale Virtual Summit. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Alyssa Cole and I'm the event manager over here at ATARC. ATARC stands for the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. ATARC is a nonprofit that facilitates collaboration between government, industry, and academia in order to accelerate technology modernization initiatives. We provide ongoing opportunities for cross agency collaboration through on site interaction learning, and market research. Thank you over to our partners over at GitLab for helping us to create today's summit. You truly great partners over to us here at ATARC. Additionally, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Today will be an informative event full of discussion about DevSecOps software development, security by design, the challenges around implementing them, and so much more. We hope you enjoy this great and informative day. We'd also like to remind you that after each panel, there will be time for Q&A. So please remember to place all of the questions that you have in those Q&A boxes on the bottom of your screens during your, the panels. Um, and so we'll be asking all of our amazing panelists those questions today. We also wanted to remind you that we'll be asking poll questions throughout our panels today. Please remember to answer those um, poll questions so you're eligible for CPE credits. Up first, I would like to introduce our visionary keynote, Gerald Karen. Gerald is the Chief Information Officer over at the Assistant Inspector General for Information Technology within the Office of the Inspector General that is within the Department of Health and Human Services. Jerry, please take it away. Good morning. And for the visionary, I'm going to put on my glasses, as a matter of fact. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, and thanks everybody for attending. Uh, this is a great subject. Uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot. I know some of the uh, presenters today are very knowledgeable in their areas and um, you know, far outweigh my intelligence uh, for sure in this subject. So um, you'll, you'll have a great day of presentations, I'm sure. So managing risk, I mean, that's why we do cybersecurity. Uh, you can, uh, of course, going back to, you know, risk management 101, you can never eliminate risk. You can, you have to manage it and you work to reduce the risk. You know, I, I, I like the KISS principle, you know, keeping it simple. You know, I see it in five um, simple steps, you know, identify all the potential risks that you possibly can. You might not be able to identify all of them. Uh, and, and that includes the risk of not taking action. Uh, and then, you know, you measure the probability of the risk happening and what that impact may be. And that, you know, equates to, you know, what the risk may be, low, medium, high, to keep it simple. And then what types of mitigation strategies can you put in place to reduce the probability? an impact of that risk? What monitoring can you put in place to um, make sure you know, you're know you aware of what's going on? Should that risk happen? And you know, plan for the disaster. Uh, what's the worst case scenario and what would you do in that worst case scenario or uh, scenario, other scenarios as well? So definitely. So definitely you wanna lessen the potential damage that could be caused by a hazard or danger, especially in the IT world. Uh, those of you that have attended or heard me talk about zero trust, uh, it's all about the risk of you know, um, access to data, uh, which is what we're trying to protect with zero trust. And one of those things that I talk about is a dynamic risk score. So one of the things, and I think you'll be talking about it today a lot is we can't always depend on humans to look for the red blinky lights and to take the appropriate actions after they figure out what is going on, um, you know, should something happen, uh, a risk becomes an actual issue and we have to take some kind of action. So the more we can automate things like through a DevSecOps pipeline, things like that, the better off we are. And, and then we get standardization and a common predictable way to examine these things for potential risks. So I think it's very important. I talk about, like I said, in Zero Trust, I talk about a dynamic risk score. And in doing that dynamic risk score, it has to be as real time as possible because you want to eliminate the risk of somebody accessing data that they're not supposed to or using it maliciously in some form or fashion. You can't, like I said, you can't rely on humans all the time to take in all the factors because we're measuring many factors at any time and factors change, uh, situations change, environments change at any given time. Therefore, we need to take the appropriate actions as soon as possible. 
So managing risk is very important. Of course, there's the risk management framework, which I definitely suggest if you're not familiar with it, that you do get intimately familiar with it. Uh, the MITRE attack framework as well is something that I definitely recommend to get familiar with in, in managing the risk. It is very important um, to understand, you know, especially when we talk about zero trust, what is it you're trying to protect and what the potential risks are in doing that and what kind of mitigations that you can put in place. And that will decide, you know, how you go about your business going forward. Uh, not, we're not all created equal. So some, we measure some risk differently than I would a different agency. So it really understands, um, it's really important to understand also your thresholds. If, this happens, what types of actions do I want to take if that threshold is met? So definitely it's something I know when I talk about zero trust, a lot of people get into the, the, you know, the tools and the technical aspects, but very much the risk management aspect, the non-technical aspects is very important to be successful and having that methodology as well. Uh, what we used to do in my last agency is we did what I would call operational risk scoring. You know, we would do um, a scan of the environment using a lot of our COTS tools. And we integrated those COTS tools and came up with what I call an operational risk score. So if there was a high patch, that patch would get a score. And if a endpoint was missing that patch, the score would be leveraged on the owner who was responsible for addressing that. And they may have vulnerabilities, they may have other patches, uh, low patches didn't score as high as a high patch and so on. Uh, misconfigurations, Active Directory stale accounts that have been logged on to, even if somebody did not take their cybersecurity training. We measured all those kind of things and we called it an operational risk score. So in a distributed model that we had in managing IT, we kind of told them, hey, this is this. If you solve this, this reaches the top. It was like playing golf. The lower your score, the better. Whatever reached the top. Hey, if you address this, this is probably the most important thing you should be addressing. And that would help lower their score. So we did it in a way that was easy for them to understand. And then they come in, they look at a sort of dashboard and say, all right, this is the most the highest thing contributing to my risk. If I knock this out, this drops my risk to maybe uh, from B and a D down to a C. And if I do the next thing, a B and so on. So it kind of highlighted what was important uh, to them to address because without doing such a scoring, they're just, you know, some of the people that are doing the work on the ground, I like to say that, you know, the, the screw, the screw, people turning the screwdrivers and really making things happen and, and managing, um, things boots on the ground it, it's you know you just give them a bunch of things to address and you really got to help them prioritize and and what's important because you know you can't do the peanut butter spread what I call the peanut butter spread approach um, or as Frederick the Great says he who tries to defend everything defends nothing um, definitely you have to be able to prioritize what your risks are and understand what those are so very important in that aspect so um but I, I believe uh, our follow-on speakers are here, Mr. Miller, uh, our facilitator, um, always great to have him here. Um, he always brings the best out in everybody that he, he talks to in these situations. And with that, I think I am going to pass it over and uh, to the next presenters. And thank you for having me, and I hope everybody enjoys their day. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that great keynote. And like Jerry said, I'll turn it over to you, Jason, for the next panel. Right, Jerry, now you put all the pressure on me. Uh, great, everything. Uh, now I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed, so I'm going to take a big deep breath and ask the other panelists to come join us. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so first of all, of course, uh, I'd like to thank all the friends at ATARC, Tom Suter, Hannah Folick, and Liz, of course. Uh, for inviting me to moderate the panel. Uh, as you've seen me uh, do these before, I do enjoy these events at Tom and, and the folks at ATARC always do a great job. As you uh, heard, I'm Jason Miller, Executive Editor of Federal News Network. You can find us on 1500 AM and of course on federalnewsnetwork.com. Uh, so uh, if you've seen me do this before, you know I like to start with little facts and figures, get your mind going. It's maybe still a little early. I'm on my first cup of coffee, so maybe you guys are on your second. But uh, a couple of things to get you going. So here we go. We're talking about cybersecurity today. So 
The first number I'll give you is 1,862, 1,862. That is the number of data breaches last year, according to Identity Theft Resource Center's 2021 data breach. Now that 1862 number surpassed 2020's total of 1108 or 1,108, and the previous record set in 2017 of 1,506. So we had over 1,862 data bre breaches. Again, this is according to the Identity Theft Resource Center's data breach report. All right, second number, 489. No, that's not the number of data breaches either. That is actually the number of known exploited vulnerabilities in the CISA exploited vulnerabilities catalog. Grant probably knew that right off the top because uh, you know he works at CISA, you know. Uh, over the last, since March 3rd, CISA added 106 new exploited, known exploited vulnerabilities. This is something that, uh, in fact, FedRAMP just updated their uh, concept of operations to ensure all cloud service providers are meeting the BOD that DHS uh, issued in November, requiring agencies to uh, pay attention to and fix these known exploited vulnerabilities. All right, last number of the day, 64. All right, what's that number about, right? 64 is the percentage of companies, this is uh, a worldwide, uh, affected by software supply chain attacks in 2021. And this is uh, from a cyber company, Ancore. The company also reports 60% of those companies said, this is from a survey, that securing their software supply chain is a top priority this year. So 64% of all companies, almost two thirds, have suffered some sort of software supply chain attack and 60% now are making software supply chain a top priority. Okay, a little food for thought for you tonight as you listen to the panelists, as you go home tonight, you can, you can wow your friends and family about uh, numbers and, and 489, uh, 1862 and, and 64%. All right, so if you've seen me moderate before, you know what I like to do, I like to, uh, to have a lot of energy. I like to get the audience questions quickly, so please participate. And most of all, I've asked each panelist to take about three to five minutes and tell you something you don't know about the secure by design approach of systems of technologies. And then we wanna to get to your questions. So again, please participate. I can ask questions all day, that's my job. I'd rather have you all ask questions. And then, uh, uh, so before we kind of kick off, just a short introduction. Obviously, we're talking about this idea of secure by design, gaining a lot of momentum since the release of the White House's Zero Trust Strategy last fall. But interestingly enough, I did a little bit of research, and this concept actually dates back to the 1980s when it was actually related to the housing industry, how folks were designing housing so they were secure. Uh, there's a lot more there to it, but I won't get into it. But obviously, today we're talking about software, how agencies and industry can, can finally stop talking about this hey, we got to build in security instead of bolting it on. I think we've heard that for the last 25 years. Uh, Tom Suter and I uh, fought those uh, uh, wars, so to speak, over the time. So what's the best way for agencies and industry to develop software that's secure from the beginning? Well, that's where our panel is going to tell us. Uh, I love this. We are unrehearsed. We are unplanned. Uh, so I'm going I'm to shake my dice. And, and Grant, you came up uh, snake eyes, so to speak. So why don't you lead us off and tell us about CIS's approach to secure by design to help agencies. Sounds great. Thanks, Jason, for the intro. So I'm Grant. Um, I work at CISA in the Office of the Technical Director, uh, which is sort of responsible for trying to uh, set the technical strategy and direction for the CISA Cybersecurity Division uh, and a lot of our, our cyber programs. So I want to talk today about um, you know, what we're doing in the space of Secure by Design. Um, I want to emphasize a couple things. You know, the first is um, you know, historically, CISA has done a lot in, in terms of incident response and, and things of that uh, nature, which are critically important to agencies. I'm sure many of you uh, have worked with our teams that come in and help you, you respond and recover. Um, but we're also uh, have been, you know, for some time, for example, with the CDM program, trying to lean into, uh, you know, building, um, you know, better practices um, into, into agency infrastructure and the way in which they develop software. Um, one thing I wanted to emphasize uh, is, you know, um, uh, an initiative that we did uh, last year, which is the Cloud Security Technical Reference Architecture, which was a partnership between CISA and um, uh, the folks at the U.S. Digital Service, as well as the folks in the FedRAMP program. And what we were trying to do with the Cloud Security TRA is essentially talk about how you, as an agency, would adopt a DevSecOps pipeline and a sort of modern microservices approach to building new applications where you can try and bake security into those applications that you're developing uh, to, to accomplish your mission. And I think there's a lot of really good guidance in there in terms of you know, how you deal with identity, how you deal with 
you know, architecture, development, testing, how you really try and make sure that the software you're building is, you know, as, as low risk as possible, as far left as possible in the development process, which is really what security by design is about. And I think, you know, in my opinion, um, you know, it's critical to try and do that as much as possible um, because, you know, everyone has legacy systems. We have to deal with legacy architectures, but we all know that complexity is the enemy of security. And by focusing on the way that you build the systems, when you're able to develop new systems, you're able to try and manage that complexity, manage that risk, manage that security, um, sort of at the point where it's created, as opposed to trying to, you know, patch or bolt on on top, which is just much more challenging. Um, and, you know, our vendor community does a great job of trying to help people do that as much as possible. But when you do have an opportunity to try and, you know, shift left and focus on uh, that early phase where you're creating something, um, you know, that is, that is definitely, you know, an opportunity to inject more security into the into the product. And I think what we've done with the Cloud Security TRA is a good example of how you can adopt those practices in the development of new systems in your agency. So that's, that's sort of one thing that I don't know that everyone has heard about. It's relatively new. Uh, I want to point people to that document. You can just search for it on the internet. And there's some, there's some, good, there's some good stuff there that addresses uh, you know, that area. All right, Grant, thank you very much. That was, that was interesting about the cloud security TRA. And, you know, when we start talking about technical reference architectures, people's eyes, you know, begin to glaze over. I remember the old, uh, back in the early 2000s when Mark Foreman started talking about enterprise architectures and the jokes that came from uh, that time. But this is a little different. This is not eyes glazed over architecture. This is not wired diagrams. Maybe just give the folks a little bit more How's it being used or how's this helping agencies use it or, or at least sure. educating agencies that exist besides you joining us today, of course? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. That's that's a great question. Yeah, so I, I should be emphasized, you know, I think the word architecture got a little bit of a bad rap um, uh, as a result of some of these EA efforts going back over decades. Different people have different opinions on them, but this is, this is very hands-on, very concrete. It's really intended for, um, you know, technical feds as well as, um, you know, contract staff and others who are really trying to build systems in a modern way um, and, and uh, really sort of hands-on brass tacks, you know, here's how, here's how we recommend you do it. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, positive adoption from a number of agencies that are trying to lean into DevSecOps, you know, Agile, these kinds of things. There's a lot of talk about them in, in the industry. There has been for years. Um, sometimes it's not clear exactly what they mean. How do they apply to me? I've got, you know, these constraints, you know, this is, we're not a startup, we're a government agency, we have requirements, we have things we have to do. Um, so what we really were trying to do here is, you know, navigate that gap, say, yes, we understand the operating context you're in, we understand you need to deal with the NIST RMF, you need to deal with, you know, security reviews, you need to deal with all these stakeholders, um, government, uh, government security requirements, how do we actually make that work in practice and cover you know both the technical content what is DevSecOps how do you adopt it how do you build a CICD or continuous integration continuous development pipeline for trying to deliver software um, but also you know how do you navigate um, things like FedRAMP how do you deal with you know, how does that fit in how do you leverage other you know service providers that may be pro providing services that you can build on top of and so we really tried to very concretely look at, you know, some simple use cases or, or in some cases, not so simple use cases. You know, how do I, how do I build a, you know, user facing, citizen facing website uh, to collect some data or whatever? And we sort of talk through the steps in some detail. So really trying to be very hands-on, very practical. There's no UML, I promise you, no scary, you know, giant complicated um, data flow diagrams. It's, uh, it's very hands-on and very sort of um, intended to sort of provide a little bit of assistance to folks trying to bake security into the way that they're developing software. All right, well, thank you for that. I know there's more questions probably coming from, from folks and uh, I look forward to uh, those questions. Um, uh, is Togai on, Togai Andrews? Is he on or is he not joining us today? Don't see him. All right. 
Well, then, Jonathan, I think you're up next. So, uh, Jonathan, GitLab, uh, tell something we don't know about uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Secure by de Design. Absolutely. Hey, hey thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, and hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm Jonathan Hunt, VP of InfoSec at GitLab. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, GitLab is a single application DevOps platform that spans the entire software development lifecycle. So we set out almost 10 years ago now to revolutionize DevOps. And in that process, we found ourselves really on the cutting edge of this DevSecOps transformation. One of our goals uh, was to provide a complete software development experience with code development, uh, security, compliance, quality, and automation all in a single application. So what does secure design mean to me? It actually means two things. One is how are we implementing secure by design into our product that the customers use to secure their environments and their source code. The second is what are we doing to provide and, and, and uh, implement a secure by design process within GitLab itself. So we're producing a secure quality product that is free from defects and vulnerabilities and exploitation. So I can talk about both of those things. I'm going to talk about the one that's a little more real world scenario to me, which is how, what am I doing to protect GitLab and the company where, where we host our customer source code repositories. So we've done two different things in that, in that, in that space, probably recently in the, in the last six to, six to nine months. The first thing is we've taken a fresh look at our hosting providers. If, if some of you have seen, uh, or if you have not yet seen, AWS, GCP, some of the other hosting providers put together a lot of great material and documentation on what it means to be secure by design in the cloud. And those documents help you ensure, ensure that you're providing uh, the, the most secure configuration of your cloud environment, which of course begins with understanding your requirements, building a, building a secure environment, enforce the use of templates, and lastly is perform validation activities. So we're doing that uh, with both AWS and GCP. The second thing that we're doing is that we've implemented a security automation team. So we built this brand new team that is designed to take on the responsibility and the role of assessing everything we're doing within GitLab from an architectural perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a code development perspective. And what we're trying to do is ensure that we can create secure code under constraints that prevent the, uh, prevents manual configuration. It prevents the post deployment corrective actions. It's designed to eliminate the uh, production of, uh, or, or, or the implementation of insecure services, right? There's a number of different things this team is working on to ensure that our teams are operating efficiently, operating in an agile fashion, building out a compliance, a compliant environment, uh, and then also ultimately creating a more auditable uh, environment uh, that's ultimately going to produce less findings, uh, provide a better auditing experience for all of the certification uh, and compliance frameworks that we're subscribed to as well as uh, creating easier data collection. All right. I wasn't sure if you are done there. So I wanna, I wanna yeah. jump it on you, Jonathan. All right, yeah, so, yeah. I have a so I have a couple follow-ups, so go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, so I was, I, so let's stop there. Let's do the follow-ups because uh, then I can okay. talk about what we're doing within the product for our customers as well, if we have time. All right, so I think one of the things that, that you know, as we talk about for the audience, perspective, uh, who it's a mix of industry and government. Uh, okay, so you're doing all these things internally, what does it mean for them? So that's great for you, you're, 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 you're tightening things up, you're, you're, you're making things better for GitLab, but, but what, what are you doing for me, Jonathan, right? So, so what does this help translate what you just told us into, okay, if I'm a customer of yours, if I'm an agency customer, if I'm a vendor customer, if I'm in the, you know, a, a different sector, what do I get from these changes? Or well, how do I use the, the, how do I benefit from your changes? Yeah, so a couple different ways. One is obviously 
we're protecting our environment, we're protecting our customers, and we're protecting our, uh, our customer source code. So that's the first thing that we're doing. Um, you know, you 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 obviously are are acutely aware, uh, and the audience is acutely aware of the current uh, risk landscape, the cyber threats, the the threats from abroad. Right? We have seen customers um, struggle with um, dealing with uh, the cyber threats, uh, such as malware, such as DDoS, such as cred stuffing and account compromise. So. We're making our environment more secure and our source code repositories more secure as well. Within the product, we're implementing more security features that are default out of the box, right? So we're creating changes within this product that is going to begin enforcing multi-factor authentication for administrative accounts, is going to disable by default open registration for all new installations. Um, so we're creating a more secure product uh, that customers are going to install out of the box is going to require less configuration to improve security of their own environment, uh, as well as protecting the source code uh, that we control. And just one qu quick follow up from there. So as you talk to your agency customers and your federal customers, are they asking uh, because because maybe explain a little bit. So when they are using your software to develop code, these changes that you've made kind of flow down to them too so they they have this i know it's not a container the way we think about it in containers but it's it's they're they're in in this kind of secure container world i know i'm not using container the right way yeah so uh so our just to just to paraphrase back you're asking how does the changes further help the customers right so, so, so as I'm, if I'm a if I'm a federal agency customer and I'm 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 looking to bring on GitLab, I'm you know, part of what we're trying to do today, obviously, is educate folks and to understand not just what you do, but how this environment is changing. GitLab's and the DevSecOps environment yeah. is changing. Yeah. How does the changes you're making kind of flow down? Not just to so if I'm using your your software, I'm getting all these benefits that you're you're implementing. But do I do I explain maybe a little bit more about, about where those benefits come in? Is it by when I use your software when I use your platform? Is it where? Yeah, absolutely. So we're doing a couple of things within the product itself. One is we're working towards FIPS compliance. Uh, so we're emb embedding, uh, we're improving, you know, the the support of cryptographic modules and, and and ensuring that insecure services and cryptographies aren't being used. We're also building in a number of different tools built into the CICD pipeline, such as uh, scanning tools. We already have the SAS, the DAS, the linting, the fuzzing. All of these tools are built are built in to this process that helps further uh, sort of. Um, it helps um, co complete those checklists, right? It helps ensure that you're meeting those FedRAMP uh, requirements, those FIPS requirements, right? Those NIST requirements that is so prevalent in this industry. So, um, so by utilizing this tool and the complete unified tool chain, you're checking off a ton of a lot of those boxes. That's providing a more secure environment that with a default configuration. All right. Thank you. I wasn't trying to put you on the spot there to help you explain no every nook and cranny, but I think I think it's it's helpful for the folks. Absolutely. All right, we got a question that has come in, so let's jump into some questions. And please, audience, uh, you can you can you can follow up with Grant and Jonathan about what they talked about. You can ask some other questions, maybe what their favorite color is. You know, we'll we'll, we'll entertain any question. But uh, we have one from our tool, and uh, they ask uh, under DevSecOps, does security secure the dev or the ops or both is it independent of dev and ops <laughs> so i guess where does security fit with dev and ops so uh, uh grant you want to pick that up and then jonathan weigh in yeah sure i mean so it's interesting right so um i think to answer this question let's sort of go back to the beginning right um so when you look at the way people build aircraft um you know there's a sort of very traditional engineering model where you do an extensive requirements develop, development process, you define your requirements very precisely, you engineer your system to meet your functional requirements, you do an extensive testing phase, and then you transition to something called operations and maintenance or o &M, where you just sort of keep the thing running, you change the parts out of the airplane, you do all of these things. Um, and as the software industry was developing, as a lot of people know, this process was incorporated 
um, into software development, still used in, in many cases today, especially in real-time critical systems where, where you have to, uh, you know, where something will live for, for many, many, many years in sort of an isolated environment, has very specific constraints and doesn't really have a need to change. Um, and so, uh, however, there was a realization that because software is sort of infinitely malleable and much, much easier to change more quickly than, for example, hardware systems, um, you know, when you change a, a, a trace on a PCB, it's a non-local change. It can ripple throughout the entire system and, and really change everything. Um, there was a sort of countervailing movement in the software community to try and accelerate the pace at which change was made, which meant that this sort of division between building the thing and maintaining the thing sort of went away. So you ended up with you know, so it was called DevOps, or the idea that you have a, a set of people who are responsible both, both for developing the thing as well as operating the thing. And in particular, that encouraged a certain type of engineer who, who thought um, both in terms of how do we build something that's going to be sustainable and easy to operate, but also apply development skills like automation and tooling to the operations. So you ended up with this synergy. It was popularized in the private sector, for example, by companies like Google with their SRE culture and things of that nature, but it was much broader than that, right? And so that's this idea of DevOps. So then played forward a few years. And what happened is people realized that, you know, having, you know, other people separate from them be the security people who would come in and sort of wave the magic security wand and apply some security pixie dust um, and you know some alerts and stuff like that was not necessarily driving the right security outcome. So there was this idea of DevSecOps, which essentially merges security both into development of the system itself as well as the security operations, responsibility for patching and keeping the systems up to date, dealing with vulnerabilities, actioning alerts, all into some sort of a combined local chain. And so in organizations that implement this practice, a lot of the responsibility for maintaining the application is pushed down into the application teams, is delegated into these very technical DevSecOps teams and pipelines. And as much as possible, this stuff is automated. So these people can manage, you know, much larger sets of systems than was traditionally possible by trying to apply, you know, the ideas of development to the ideas of operating and securing the systems. So that's really sort of what I think DevSecOps means. It's not that they're sort of, they're like, you apply the dev to the sec and the ops and the ops to the dev and, and sort of the idea that they're all complementary skills that, if you fuse them together as opposed to siloing them, you can sort of achieve unique outcomes. So that's sort of my take on it. Jonathan, I don't know what you think. Yeah, Grant, I, I think you explained it very well. Yeah, what I would add is, is look, like we've tried it. We, we, we've tried it both ways, right? I think, I think companies, the industries, we've tried it both ways. We, we tried bringing a security team in and, and, and just letting development go. And it's, did we come in after the fact and we run our scans and now we got all these things to fix and development has a new milestone and new features of release. And now they have to go back and fix all these vulnerabilities and, and, and that's created problems. So oh, that's okay. So that's not, that's not working. That's not working. Okay. So let's just, let's just go about it a different way let's give the developers all these tools to just like fix it themselves right let's shift left let's put like you know scanning agents on local laptops and just like let them you know monitor their own source code and fix it before it goes into production well two problems there number one is they're not all security experts they may be development experts right and, and, and in fact they they are and that's why they they are the developers that's why they're in that role uh, so they may not know how to, you know, um, mitigate like LFEs or, um, you know, disclosures or uh, XSS or something like that, right? So, so they may not actually understand how to mitigate those. They may not understand secure coding practices. They may not understand everything involved with an OWASP top 10. So that's number one. Um, and the second problem with that is, guess what? They still have their milestones. They still have the goals and objectives that where they have to get this code out at this time to get this feature release out. So that didn't really work either. 
And, and so as Grant alluded to, really the solution is it's, it's a collaboration, it's a synergy of the two together. We have to work together and partner together to ensure that we can be successful, right? Ultimately, in the end, everyone's job is to ensure the success of the business, right? And, and keep us secure and keep, you know, keep our service attractive and, and lucrative, right? To our customers or to our stockholders, right? Or shareholders. So, um, so I think one, one strategy that really works and something that I've used at the last few companies I've been at is rather than having this siloed, we got the security organization, we got this development organization, and we've got this infrastructure organization, which is how, how I, that's what I grew up in. Okay. Like I've been, I've been in the industry for 20 years. That's how it's been for like 15 of those years. Right. And what I've done over the last couple of organizations, and, and as we begin to understand more about, you know, just the, the, the benefits of like cross-functional collaboration and cohesiveness between teams and the synergies of teams working together and agile work processes. As I be, began creating these teams that weren't just an AppSec team, it's a development counterpart, okay? It's not just an InfraSec team, it's an infrastructure counterpart, right? And so I've created these forward-facing counterpart teams to development to infra to ux to quality to it and those team members go to those team stand-ups they're part of those code reviews they're part of those architecture reviews and and in the collaborative nature of the two coming together and an appsec person saying like oh we can't do it that way you have to do it this way and then they hear the response and the response is like like we can't or okay, but that's going to cause a one month delay or like that type of feedback loop is what allows us to create secure code faster, get features out quicker uh, and provide a better product and service. Yeah, I just want to add one one thing before we put this one to rest. So I agree with everything Jonathan said. Um, the other point is, you know, sometimes people think, oh, if we're doing DevSecOps, we're losing independence. There's no one looking over my developers. We're losing something there. Um, I think Jonathan's point is the critical one. It's you, you, you can still structure your organization in such a way that you maintain some independence of your security teams, of your test teams, and so on. Um, but you sort of integrate the process of developing things so that the feedback is discussed more openly as opposed to you know, late in the game when it's when it's difficult to change and it triggers like a long a reset cycle. Um, but I do think, you know, and this is not to say you get rid of, you know, socks or anything like that. You still have these capacities there. Um, it's just not there. The It's just not there sort of presumed to magically be able to solve your security problems by virtue of existing. They're providing an additional layer of defense on top of the um, the sort of DevSecOps process, which is attempting to put as much security as you can earlier in the process, and you have additional sort of compensating controls in addition to that. All right, appreciate you both explaining. I think it's it's an important factor when we talk about because we hear a lot of DevSecOps. What's it mean? Where's it where's it belong? And and I think the one thing we hear time and again about this approach is it's it's bringing together the the technical folks the developers the security folks and the mission folks so when the mission folks says i want to do that and the developer says i can do that and the security folks go well let's talk about what that actually means and they can all have that conversation versus i think jonathan you, you and grant you both brought it up the the after the fact which we all you know how many times do we have to say it like stop stop doing it that way um, so so let, let's let's maybe take it to the, the the next step of the conversation is so a lot of agencies say we're 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 just getting into DevSecOps we're just starting Agile we're start we're just kind of getting there uh, and and Grant start us off and then Jonathan you can tell us what you hear from your customers as well but are agencies getting there as they say they are or is it the old Agile front end with the waterfall back end where they're still writing 400 page requirements that are very prescriptive. Of, uh, of, um, of of each thing to do. And Alyssa just reminded me, I gotta do a poll. So while you all think about that question, Alyssa, let's do the first poll. All right, does security by design speed up or slow down software delivery? Uh-oh, that's a good one. Grant, you can't answer this, neither can you, Jonathan. All 
right. Well, that well, folks, answer the question. Uh, let's go back to my initial question: is is what are we really seeing, Grant? When when you have those conversations, are yeah. our agencies getting or moving in the right direction fast enough, or is they still kind of it's a slower move? Look, I mean, I think it. I think agencies are moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Um, it's a long process. You know, this transition has been going on for years, both in the private sector as well as in the government. Um, I think there are some, uh, you know, uh, some good examples. So some agencies, um, you know, have adopted this. Some, you know, very uh, sort of some particular CIOs have come into the government, really pushed this hard, and their agency has been successful. Um, at, at driving it through. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to name specific names of agencies, but I think that there are examples of agencies who've really leaned into this and been able to, you know, do some, some great things. Also at the policy level, we've seen um, embrace, you know, from, from folks, for example, at OMB, at GSA, at CISA, on, on supporting agencies who are trying to do this. So I definitely think we're seeing adoption. That said, um, you know, there is a deep cultural tradition um, coming from, let's call it physical engineering or cyber physical engineering, building systems that are much more difficult to change and much less abstracted in many cases than software. Um, and, and we know uh, that the process that we use to build those systems while slow, very slow, um, it does produce functional outcomes. And so I think there is a Although sometimes in the context of cybersecurity in software, we have we have a, another layer of problems um, because the pace turns into security risk uh, in a way that wasn't necessarily the case, um, you know, when you're building other kinds of systems like bridges or things like that. And so I think, yeah, I mean, we are seeing adoption. We're seeing a slow transition. We're seeing a lot of great examples of success, but we're also seeing plenty of examples of, uh, of, of, you know, calling something agile when it's really not, packaging up what you're already doing under new words. Um, and, uh, and it's hard, right? I mean, I, I understand why a lot of the policy encourages certain things that is not necessarily consistent with agile. Um, and you know, it, that stuff takes a long time to change. Um, and there are you know, good arguments that in some contexts uh, you really maybe wanna go in a different direction. But I think in general, to what I was saying earlier, you know, yes, the, the fact that software is infinitely malleable, the fact that security risk requires quick action, um, the fact that there's an increased demand for, you know, delivering functional software systems uh, quickly and, uh, you know, in a way that's responsive to the end users, um, you know, that requires loop closure uh, of the nature that we're talking about here. And we have seen some, some amount of success, although there's certainly a long way to go. Uh, Grant, you're kind. I, I would point out a couple of the the, the leaders of the USCIS, of course, at DHS. We we've they've had a long history. Long history off. from Mark Schwartz, and and yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Uh, and of course, our friends at Patent Trademark Office and, and Jamie Holcomb, the CIO over there, has done a great job. And then there's these other pockets uh, across government that um, definitely are, are ahead of the curve. Uh, uh, Jonathan, we saw the poll come up. Secure by design. It depends. They said sixty percent said it depends. Uh, that seemed uh, I was a little surprised by that. But from your from your experience, what are you seeing from your agency customers as they talk about agile DevSecOps? Are they are they moving quickly enough? Are they are you ne probably never quickly enough? But but what are you seeing? <laughs> <laughs> never quick enough. Yeah, uh, I, I was. I, that's exactly what I was. I was going to echo a little bit of what Grant said. I so in the we obviously have customers across private public sector uh, uh, as well. We um, we are seeing better adoption. On, on the private side, right, with, with the private sector. We do put out, what's interesting is, is GitLab does publish a DevSecOps survey annually where we survey somewhere around four to 5,000 um, high level security professionals, usually like directors, VPs, C-levels across the industry all on DevSecOps, changes, innovations, uh, the evolving platform itself, uh, changes in policies, changes in ideas. And we are seeing from that survey that more and more uh, companies across the board are adopting DevSecOps uh, strategies, DevSecOps idea, ideology, tooling, shifting left, trying to you know, we're trying to get ahead of security prior to like production merge. Now, from the government side, 
from the public sector side, we do work with 165 agencies. And I would say it is moving a little bit slower. Now, fortunately, what I can say is that GitLab itself, the tool is designed to be a, not just a DevOps, but a DevSecOps platform. We do build in a number of automated security tooling within the, uh, within the software development lifecycle. We have a bunch of, you know, QA and, and automated testing. Um, but I, I think sometimes it, it, it comes down to interpretation. Right. I think sometimes people think like, oh, so now that I'm running scans during the during the CI CD pipeline, I'm now doing DevSecOps versus running scans afterwards, running your little Nessus or Tenable or Qualys scanner afterwards. You know, and, and I think it's more than that, right? I think it's more than just running a scan. Right. I think it's more than just getting a list of vulnerabilities and, and just, you know, setting them on, you know, your 30, 60, 90 day, you know, SLAs. Right. And and so it's interesting sometimes when you hear about the number of companies that are uh, adopting DevSecOps or what they think is DevSecOps. And then you kind of get that, like, what does it mean to you? Like you kind of get to like the fundamental understanding of, you know, is it automation? Is it compliance? Is it remediation? Is it time to mitigation, right? Is it solving these problems before, you know, it's produced publicly, right? Um, so it is interesting. I think different companies are at different stages of that life cycle. I think some struggle more than others. I can also say on the private sector being a software tool that has a cloud presence and a self-managed service as well, um, a lot of our customers really are kind of new to the space, right? We do deal with a lot of startups and software providers and SaaS companies that, that have the benefit of adopting that technology from the beginning, right? Versus an, an organization that's been founded and technology has changed over the last 20 years and they have to continue to transform and evolve, right? Into these technological transformations, into the cloud transformation, into the digital transformation, you know, migrating away from uh, old, you know, data centers and, and, and servers and, and mainframes and all these other technologies. So I would say it's not surprising to me that some organizations are adopting a DevSecOps strategy uh, quicker and more rapidly than others. Uh, but that's what I'm seeing uh, from our customers. All right. We got about, and about 10 or so minutes left, give or take. Uh, I want to continue to remind the audience to submit some questions. Again, it can be about what we've talked about already, it could be a new question. It could be just something you're wondering about when it comes to secure by design. We have two experts, so don't, don't miss that opportunity to take advantage of these two uh, experts. Uh, Grant, I, I want to shift over to uh, the discussion about the challenges around uh, secure by design. Is, the, is From your perspective and where CISA stands, because NIST put out a recent uh, software security guide based on the executive order in, in the zero trust strategy. We can't not have a conversation about security without talking zero trust. The OMB calls out secure by design. What are some of the next steps we should be looking for from CISA, from NIST, from OMB around the executive order, around secure by design that, that maybe are coming or, or maybe even if it's outside the EO specifically, but something that relates that CISA is working on? Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, so one topic we haven't really talked a lot about uh, yet uh, and is near and dear, I know, to Jonathan's heart um, uh, and, and to mine as well is uh, software supply chain. So I do want him to, to touch on that a little bit. But CISA, you know, in the aftermath of SolarWinds, NIST and CISA have both taken a look at software supply chain um, and tried, you know, to think through, okay, in the long run, you know, how do we actually build an environment or a, a culture in the in the community where we can sort of keep track of what's going into our software so that we know what we need to patch. I mean, we saw the same thing with Log4j, where you have a vulnerability in a library that's used by everything. And, you know, we don't even know what systems are using Log4j because uh, there's no standardized way of tracking this. I mean, you know, certain build tool chains and whatever, you can keep track of it in specific contexts, but it's, it's not standardized and it's not broadly uh, used, uh, keeping track of, you know, what goes into the software so that you can know what to patch and so on. And, 
Um, let me let me jump in. I'm going to jump in just real quick because I want to just uh, a quick follow up right there. CDM is not necessarily would 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 not was not designed to to deal with log4j. Correct. This CDM was designed to say, okay, I have a laptop on my yeah. network. I have a of a the, this device on my network, but not yeah. necessarily a piece of software. Okay. Right. And people, exactly. And and just to, is, to provide right to provide a concrete example. What did CDM right? do? Log4j has one CVE at some level, the, the root one, you know, the root vulnerability, but it spawned thousands and thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities in, you know, products um, through, in some cases, many, many layers of inclusion of this library. Um, and, and, you know, the scanners are, were just not set up for that, right? There was just an open question you know, should everyone have their own CVE number in their own product for everything that's derivative of log4j, you know, all the way out to the final piece of installed software? Um, and, or is it all just one? And, and then the scanners really need it to be separate, but like it, it just sort of, so it's just not designed to handle these sort of deep chains of software, right? Among other things. Um, and so we really, we really saw that in trying to respond to log4j both inside the government and in the broader cybersecurity community. And so I think, yes, both CISA and NIST are, are trying to think about, okay, long-term, you know, five, 10 years from now, what, what do we do to try and as an industry, you know, do this? And there are some companies um, in the industry that have really been forward leaning on this. Um, some of the big CSPs, you know, have pretty sophisticated, um, you know, infrastructure around, around this, but in the general community, uh, there, there's, there's, there's clearly been an identified need to figure out, um, you know, how to keep better track of what's in the software, uh, so that we can respond and also uh, understand our risk from a, um, you know, some from like a solar winds kind of compromise of the supply chain point of view. So that's, I think that's one area um, that we haven't talked about that CISA and, and NIST are and, and OMB are trying to think about, you know, playing into the future. Um, maybe I'll stop there and let Jonathan comment on this. We could talk about others uh, as well. Yeah, there, there are a few topics that are more daunting than supply chain, especially to my role, to my company, uh, to what we do in the software space, uh, to all the, uh, I mean, we are open source, right? I mean, the amount of dependencies uh, that, that, that not only that we utilize, but the amount of dependencies that our customers leverage uh, in their GitLab build is substantial, right? And, and with Log4j is a great example. I, I was, I was going to mention the same thing. We, it's, we were leveraging uh, a software bill of materials that we have built into GitLab. And, and yeah, sure, you could go in and identify, oh, there's Log4j in these three locations. Well, sure, if, if everything is, is, um, is, is cataloged by that bill of materials, right? So you have to, you, you have to uh, catalog um, all your projects, all your instances, all your groups into uh, that bill of materials, right? So it's like an inventory, it's like an asset inventory, right? Uh, but on the software side. So um, what we found is, and in, in not only here at GitLab, but what our customers also found was, we thought we quickly remediated the risk. We kind of put out a little uh, blog saying, hey, good news, we found, we found it was in our product in these two or three locations we've taken care of it, right? Like it's all good. We, we either patched it or we, we uh, uh, eliminated it from, from that. You know, we, I think it was like in one of our scanners, we took it out. Um, but here's the thing, right? As the weeks continued to go on, we found that, well, we had these other dependencies that used log4j that we didn't even know about until later, right? So there's, a, there's even a blind spot in that. So dependency management, is is a real challenge i think for all of us right now i think it's more than just knowing what open source components you use what dependencies you use what's in your product but it's what do those dependencies also use right and that's we're not always going to know that unless you know, you have 700 people on your security team and all they do is look at every line of code and every change in your environment every second of every day. Uh, so it's a real challenge. Uh, I'm looking for answers. Grant actually told me he has the answer to that and he's going to share it with me after the call. So oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, yeah, the only other thing I'll, I'll note on this one is 
um, you know, sometimes it's talked about as an open source security problem. It's not an open source security problem. It's a software security problem. Uh, commercial uh, software does not magically mean that they do a beautiful job of tracking their dependencies, even uh, even the commercial dependencies, you know, between companies and things like that. Um, but also there's, you know, usage of open source and commercial. So this is really a generic software security problem. It happens that there are, um, you know, a, a wide commons of open source software that's used by lots of things, but from a tracking of dependencies and understanding your dependency risk, that's really a software security problem that we as an industry need to need to figure out over the coming years. All right, let's do another poll. Uh, since we got about five minutes left, we gotta get through two of them. So here's the other poll. How does security by design impact compliance? All right, it's a good one too. Let's see what folks tell us. In the meantime, um, let's uh, let's uh, we're going to wrap up here. We're, again, if, if folks have one last chance to send us any questions, please do so. We've got about five minutes left to the next panel. Uh, so, Grant, so you talked about software security. You talked about supply chain. Uh, are there specific initiatives or, or things that we should look out for that that SIS is working on? So, cloud technical reference architecture was so twenty twenty one. What's going to be twenty twenty two? Again. I know you're thinking, what, what have you done for me lately? All right, so um, uh, poll comes in, uh, secure by design helps meet compliance goals. 88% says Good. so. Uh, interesting uh, interesting response. So yeah. go ahead, Grant, tell us. Uh, yeah, tell us I mean, so, so right. So we, we will have, you know, further things coming out on SPOM and software security in 2022. Um, you know, the zero, tr I think the last time I was on a panel, um, uh, someone asked me about this CISA zero trust maturity model. I was you know, quoted in the press saying we're working on it. Um, that's still true. Um, uh, it's being worked on. Um, we recognize there's an important need here for, for the final version of that to come out. Um, and uh, so that that's something to uh, to look forward to. Um, there's also, you know, other other CISA initiatives um, in terms of, you know, SaaS security, things of that nature uh, that are being worked, um, that, that'll be coming forward. Um, you know, uh, certainly OMB is, is in the driver's seat on zero trust right now. They're trying to, you know, everyone has seen the new FISMA metrics. They're trying to, you know, figure out how to drive adoption um, of that transition. I think that sits hand in hand with secure by design. Um, and, uh, and so I think, yeah, I know it's an exciting time. There's a lot happening. Hopefully we can, uh, you know, to, to what Gary said at the beginning, we can, uh, Jerry said at the beginning, we can drive down the risk. All right. So we will look for the maturity model, some of the sassy stuff. I think that's a popular topic as well. And, and if you haven't seen the FISMA metrics, obviously you can find them. Uh, so Jonathan, we're gonna do the next poll now, and then we're gonna ask you what's the big takeaway from this conversation. What should really folks, both industry and government really keep in mind as they move toward this secure by design effort? So the question is, where do you currently stand in implementing secure by design in your agency? All right. Jonathan, this, is, this one's specifically for you all to see, see where they stand and where you can help them. All right, so in the meantime, Jonathan, tell us what, what's the big takeaway? Where should agencies and, and vendors go next with this? What should they keep in mind as they move forward with this concept? Yeah, so there's a lot of things that you can do to implement secure by design, right? You could think, again, I think I mentioned in, at the beginning, you could think about access management, you could think about network segmentation, you could think about resource management, you can think about encryption. Um, what I would encourage everyone to do is first and foremost, be thinking about, and this is uh, on, honestly largely um, sort of stipulated on current events and the cyber threats I'm seeing against GitLab, against our customers, against our data, is really be thinking more about like, how can we immediately protect uh, access rights, permissions to our data, to our repositories, to our source code? Right. There's a number of different things you can do. Right. One is you can create like um, uh, templates, like role uh, role templates, right? That that have a predefined uh, access rights and permissions uh, based on team needs. Right. Another thing you can do is uh, immediately. I would suggest everyone audit database access. What we're seeing is is companies. What we do what we do really well is that we grant access. That's what we do well. What we don't do well is revoke access, right? Or time bound that access. And in, in just recently in, in audit of one of our customers found that over 200 people had access directly to the database, Rails, console access, 
there was there was two times that that access that had access to customer data from front end applications, right? It, it's when when somebody needs access, it's easy to just grant that access, but we don't go back and and and, and correct that. So. I'm thinking about access rights. I'm thinking about permissions. I'm thinking about database access. I'm thinking about two-factor authentication. I'm thinking about automated account uh, permissions and creation. So I would say immediately that's where my focus would be due to the current threat. Um, and, and also from historically, where I've seen a majority of account compromise comes from, right? Company compromise is coming from uh, leaked credentials or cred stuffing. That's if you look at the FISMA report to Congress uh, back in 2020, that was a big when the cred stepping was one of the big ones that came up. Grant, did you have one more thing you want to add or just you same you're seeing the same, same thing? Okay. All right. Well, we were right at 11 o'clock. So I'm going to uh, first of all, thank Grant and thank Jonathan for being such good sports. So we were a little short on the panel, but we made it through and we did a great job. Hopefully the audience learned something more importantly and uh, have some stuff to walk away from. I will pass it over to Alyssa and my friend Tom Suter. Grant, Jonathan, thank you so much. Round of applause to you both. Thank you so much, Jason and panelists for that great insight. Up next, we'll go right into our next panel. Um, I'll turn it over to Tom Suter for um, that for moderating. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, boy, thanks for putting me right after Jason Miller. You know, I mean, I have to succeed this guy from Fed News Network. It's a lot of pressure on me. Uh, Jason, can we pull you back on for a second? Are you on? Can you come yeah, back yeah, on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, I have to succeed you. Uh, the great Jason Miller, the reporter's reporter. I was actually wondering before I go yeah. into my panel is what kind of stories are you working on this week? Uh, this week, well, uh, today, uh, there's a couple kind of small ones that are out there. So if you're following DOD and procurement, there's a big protest of their Defense Enclave Services, $11 billion award to Lidos. GDIT filed that protest just last week. So uh, a little bit on that. And then, um, uh, GSA issued uh, an RFI around the commercial platform. So this is looking to next generation update this. This is through um, Amazon, Fisher Scientific, and Overstock.com, kind of making these micro purchase thresholds under $10,000 easier for agencies. So those are the two kind of big, bigger ones that I'm working on this week. And, um, you know, the rest is, uh, uh, you know, kind of take it as you comes, right? Like, what, what's the news? Uh, I saw our friend Sanjay Gupta, your, our, our friend Tim Harvey broke that story to him. Sanjay Gupta is going over to get a new job, uh, be a new CIO. So I uh, probably have to do something on that now that Tim broke that news. So what else? Uh, what else is out there? I don't know. You tell me. What's the news? Maybe Chris and Joe and Jerry could tell me something. Yeah. What's the news I'm missing? Yeah. So Jason. So to my panelists, Jason cares about breaking news. So tell them to help Jason out today. Try to break <laughs> some news for us. Okay. That that's really helpful to our friend Jason Miller. Well, thank you, Jason. Hopefully, next time I will see you, it'll actually be in person. I'm looking. I'm looking for the in Annapolis and Guy Tech, right? That's our. That's the next one. Yeah, I think on my agenda yeah. for you all. Self promotion yeah, uh, time. Uh, early May. All right. <laughs> thank you, my friend. All right. Thanks all. Take care. Enjoy the panel. Okay. Great. Um, well, now we're diving into our little panel here. Um, just to, I'll do some real quick introductions, and then and then we'll lead off and have each of you all. Uh, you know, give your give your kind of your perspective. It's really interested in this panel, but uh, first I will introduce Jerry Hagedorn. Am I saying that right, Jerry? Sorry, I should have cleared that up on the prep call. Nope, that's correct. Hagedorn, correct? Great. And uh, Jerry is IT operations and management section chief of the Information Solutions Division at the Farm Production and Conservation Business Center, United States Department of Agriculture. We also have with us. Uh, Chris Christ, who's Chief of Cyber Operations and Development Command Control Communications and Cyber Systems. Uh, welcome, Chris. And he's also at US Transcom, of course. So it, welcome. And he's also a noted fact about Chris. He's working on his PhD. So um, I know that how, we'll have to get an update on how that's coming. And last but not least, we have uh, uh, Joel Kruiswick, who's a Senior Manager Solutions Architect uh, public sector at GitLab. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, maybe we'll, uh, Jerry, if you don't mind kicking things off, um, you know, about what you're working on and a little bit of background about your agency, too, because I know that's a relatively sure. recent development and it trips people up a little bit, including me on the prep call. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, as you mentioned, right, so I work for Farm Production um, and Conservation or FPAC. 
Um, and, and that uh, mission, uh, mission area within USDA uh, was a combination of what was previously the Farm Service Agency, FSA, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, um, and uh, the Risk Management Agency. So um, FSA is focused on uh, like subsidy, disaster, and conservation. Um, that sort of the, covers the farm programs area. And then there is a farm loans uh, part of FSA. Um, as you might guess, NRCS uh, focuses solely on conservation. Um, and then Risk Management Agency uh, supports uh, crop insurance through our uh, approved insurance providers. Um, so rather large um, mission area, we have uh, almost 22,000 employees that we support, um, well over 2 million producers that we support on a daily basis. Um, and uh, I support over 450 different applications about, you know, covering about 70 uh, ATO systems today. So as, as far as some background about me, um, 25 plus years uh, in IT, I started off as an application developer, moved into uh, the architecture realm um, and into various leadership positions. Um, most of my early career was in the private sector, ended up in the public sector for several years, um, both initially as a contractor and then as a Fed. Um, I actually uh, left uh, the public sector uh, back in 2016, uh, spent three years working in the private sector after kind of spending my whole career doing app dev um, and, and led an organization. Uh, we started off about 100, a uh, private sector organization from about 140 total staff to about 700. So basically doubling every year for three years. So it was a, it was a really fun ride going through that. Um, and they were a insurance brokerage, very technology focused. Every um, uh, lead that we uh, acquired was ran through machine learning and all this started back in 2016. Um, and, and so my, my focus there really transitioned from the app dev side to DevSecOps and operations. So then when I came back into the public sector, that's really been my focus the, you know, the last two and a half years is getting our cloud um, uh, migration effort up and running because we're in the progress of uh, kicking off migrating about 400 of those 450 systems. Um, and then really evangelizing DevSecOps practices. So that was a lot of what I learned um, you know, as, I, as I did that in the private sector. And so a big Part of my learning now is really taking those concepts that I, you know, learned and developed in the private sector and figuring out how to scale them, right, which is kind of applicable to the discussion today. So that's been a big focus. Um, so I think those are the key things. Well, I think there's one more key thing I need to find out from you. So you're out of Kansas City. I spent a lot of my early career with right. Sprint, you know, like working with Sprint. So I'd go to Kansas City all the time. What are the favorite barbecue joints that you have out there that you like? That's <laughs> um, critical, right? Absolutely. So it, it, it sort of depends on what you want. Like uh, Charbar for me um, has the best burn-ins because, you know, burn-ins have to have just a little, you know, have to have a good fat content to them. Um, so Charbar mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is my favorite there. And I'm a big burn-ins fan. So that Charbar is one of my favorites. Great. Great. Well, thanks for that. I need to get back there. Anyway, back to our panel here in DevSecOps. Uh, Chris. Yeah, hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you great. Perfect, perfect. Yep, so yeah, Chris, Chris, that's the name. And I'm here at US Transportation Command. Uh, we're, you know, we're primarily involved with applications or, or programs uh, that, that help from a land, sea, and air perspective, you know, across the globe. And so where I fit in is, is I'm leading uh, the way for modernization of all these programs, uh, specifically towards DevSecOps methodologies and leveraging some cloud native um, activities. And, and oh, I'm ultimately responsible for cloud migration activities too. So we have a few different cloud environments that we're uh, responsible for, but currently actually we've recently uh, gotten the, the green flag to go ahead and move forward towards a migration towards cloud one and leveraging platform one capabilities as well. So a lot of exciting things happening right now uh, in that realm. Uh, when it comes to me, um, you know, I, I joined, actually joined the military as a, as a combat medic right out of high school and uh, got my education when I was there in computer science and all that and, and just got really excited to get into the realm of IT and healthcare. Um, got into the private sector after my six year active duty stance and uh, became the CIO of a few different hospital systems and uh, saw some really exciting things happen there as well. 
Then I commissioned as a medical service corps officer in the Air Force Reserve. I'm still in a reservist today. Uh, and now I'm, I'm, I'm here, right? So, and there, there were a few steps along the way, but now I'm here and, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it, it is exciting to, to see where things are going um, and, and what we're trying to do and then think of where I was at before. So putting it all together, um, I, think, uh, I think I'm in a good place. So yeah, I, I'm great, excited, great. To, excited to walk through some of the, the questions today. Yep, yep. and uh, where are you operating out of today? It looks like you're in the office. Yeah, they have us back. They have us. So I'm actually, my building is a secure building. We're not allowed to have any personal devices or anything like that. So I actually had to travel to a whole nother building. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they have us, they have us on site nowadays. Um, so many days a, a week now. Well, the things you do for ATAR, thank you so much for doing that. Um, next, uh, we'll go with Joel. And I'd love to hear your perspectives because you see things across government and across industry. And uh, excited to have you on. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You know, I feel like Jerry introduced me already. Like we've lived parallel lives somehow. I mean, about the same time window of, of uh, experience you know, coming out of private sector, you know, and 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 ending up here in the public sector. Uh, pretty parallel journeys. An interesting twist on mine, though, is I focused on the internet back in the early days, working for, dare I say, U.S. robotics and, and all those DOCSIS uh, standards as they evolve. So I uh, feel like I contributed back then to where we are now. It's kind of one of those rewarding career points, right? Um, but yeah, you know, fast forward, I've been here around GitLab for about four and a half years now, which uh, puts me back in when there was about 150 of us here at GitLab. And I became kind of enamored with cybersecurity as we grew. And so as, as that market shift became so apparent, uh, I started kind of following what was happening across not only small and mid-sized companies, but the enterprise and then the public sector. And uh, that, that's kind of led me to where we are today, right? Watching how people have implemented or not implemented have really had a lot of success or monumental <laughs> failure at scale as we look at the cybersecurity world. So I'm looking forward to uh, this chat today for sure. Great, great. Well, I'll dive right into it. Um, you know, what are you, how do you, so all these DevSecOps teams, DevSecOps teams, I don't know, in my experience, I've run a few. They think they're special snowflakes. They are, have to do things their way. Uh, you know, they, they think that their way is the best way. How do you ensure consistent DevSecOps practices across all your agency's development teams? And maybe start off with you, Jerry. Um, so a couple of the things that we're doing, I'll, I'll talk through it. Um, so when we kicked off, this was one of those topics that we really worked through, right? Is how do we drive consistency across all of FPAC? Um, and one of the things that, uh, that I stumbled upon uh, was the Team Topology book by Matthew Skelton and Manuel Payas. And, and that book did an amazing job of really laying out um, you know, a lot of the basic concepts and why you should do DevSecOps and sort of talking about cognitive load and a lot of those things. And that really helped us in our conversation um, and sort of talking through those things. And what, what we did um, and what we're doing today is we're creating these platform teams, um, and that's part of how we're trying to scale it. And so we're, we're dividing it up into sort of two layers. Uh, one is uh, the teams that are focusing on the application, um, uh, you know, basically the CI, CD pipeline side of things. And then below that, um, in support of them, is what we're calling our platform automation um, platform teams. And the idea there is, and this was kind of one of the things as we dug into this, you know, when I, when I had a small team at, at in, you know, in the private sector, when you have three or four folks doing DevSecOps, you just have one team and they do everything, right? But when you get to, a, you know, the scale that we're at inside of FPAC, one team can't do everything. So how do you start to divide that and how do you balance those things and how do you work through the fact that we can start, you know, creating layers, the risk is, you know, you get bottlenecks and those sorts of things. And so that's, not having seen a lot of publications and how to do that, that's the approach that we're using right now. So, you know, all of the CICD pipelines and the, and the platform automations are being done by, starting to be done by centralized teams. And then those teams that are in, in the ops are going to be providing those, or providing those services to the app dev teams, you know, so that they can focus on the development of software, the ops teams can focus on those pipelines. 
Great. Uh, Chris, I know you just went to platform one, so that seems to handle some of the ops part of it, right? Uh, yeah, that's correct. And and so currently, uh, so we do currently have, of course, our, we call it our US Transcom Go Cloud environment, but uh, we essentially do have a platform as a service there as well. Uh, and so, you know, my team, uh, we are, I have government em employees uh, that are actually injected uh, into all these different programs um, to help them along with that. So essentially we would come up with this platform uh, based on DOD guidance uh, that shows, okay, here are the tools that we're using. Here's our software factory. Here's our runtime environment. Here's, here's how it works. And that kind of gives them their North star of where to go. This is what you refactor to or modernize to whatever term we want to use. And then we help them with that uh, again, by having someone injected uh, from my team into their team. Uh, they're part of their weekly collaboration points. And some of them have, of course, their daily meetings and all that. And we're a part of those conversations and we help with the contract modifications, the PWS as a language, all these things to, to try to make this as simple as possible uh, for them. And then uh, to Jerry's point, yes, you know, we have, we have engineers uh, that are maintaining that platform so that the, the developers themselves don't have to worry about that. They're developing code, they're pushing new capability, and then they simply push through our software factory and then through our runtime environment via you know, Kubernetes. Great, thank you. Uh, Joel, what have you seen best practices across uh, government? Yeah, practically speaking, I think the shift we're seeing is, you know, a lot of times what we've seen in the past is, is there's a group that's this this barrier, right? They're the siloed barrier point for things to get to production. They slow progress, they're the bottleneck. Um, and the conversation around shift left turned out to be kind of messy, right? And we saw some things shift left into development, put some ownership there, but not necessarily expediting anything, getting out the door. And that conversation has now turned into centralized compliance, right? How is it that we have that centralized management of some of the operational components, right? So when you talk about pipeline management, things like that, what does it look like to make sure everybody is on the same page, that we are all working from the same framework and make sure that, that nobody's working around it? Right. And, and that way we're being proactive about it and we're not necessarily holding up the back end. We can kind of expedite some of the approvals without having the mechanics following the development cycles. And I think that's one of the shifts I've seen really happening over the last 18 months that that is is uh, most exciting to me because it's, it's moving us forward in how fast code goes out the door. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next. I We've had a lot of federal policies, DOD policies kind of come out, some from NIST, you know, CISA's come out, you know, we have the cyber executive orders, you know, especially the zero trust one that came out. How is that affecting, you know, of course, all these are unfunded. So like, how does that affect you? You have your plan and the game plan is going out the door and then, you know, you're not allowed to, you know, if it was football terms, you're not allowed to, you know, you know, they just change a rule right in the middle of it. Uh, how does that affect? How does that affect you? And how do you align with these policies, Gary? So, this is kind of a tale of two worlds, right? <laughs> so, there's the all of our existing solutions, our legacy systems, mainframe, and and even you know our older um, you know web-based systems are really in a bind on a lot of these mandates, right? Because they just don't handle these things very well. Um, on the other hand, when you look at where we're going with our DevSecOps modernization, our cloud migrations, as part of that, you know, we really focused on following our cloud service providers best practices. And a lot of those things have these, you know, zero trust and best practices baked into them. Um, and I think you even see that, you know, in the, in the, the OMB memo, uh, I think it's like on page 16 where it calls out you know, the, the, you know, that these cloud service providers do a really good job of these things and you should leverage them, right? And, and so the good thing is from that front, that was kind of the tack that we took, you know, two years ago. And so I think we're in a really good position from that perspective, but, you know, for three years, we're going to live with a foot in both worlds and you're going to have to live through that. Thank you for that. Uh, Chris? Uh, yes, that, that's, uh, that, that memo, um, I think it's a benefit and, and for sure. And it's certainly um, set a fire 
uh, you know, under under our feet here, which is which is good. Uh, so we we our organization, as big as it is, uh, they went ahead and created an IPT around this whole effort, actually. And so so we have, in my mind, we have a couple of different ways of doing this. So we have, of course, our current environment, as I mentioned. How do we accomplish zero trust here? Of course, it's not just buying a tool and then you're good. We all, I think hopefully a lot of us know that. So it's a methodology that we're incorporating. But how that's accomplished is going to look different in our current environment than it would in the cloud one environment. Uh, to Jerry's point, you know, the way that cloud one does this via their paths of AWS or Azure uh, at this point in time, um, they have certain things in place that that will help you uh, to achieve those zero trust metrics. And then if you're going to go towards leveraging some platform one capability, uh, they specifically point to the big bang, right? Then there are some things that you can do within there as well, you know, leveraging a service mesh and things like that to help you to accomplish zero trust principles methodologies. So yeah, we're, 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 we got an IP together. I'm, I'm on the one end of, Hey, where we're going. And then we have some folks that are looking at the current and then trying to connect it all together. Great. Great. Joel. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll call it an exciting time, right? Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot coming awfully fast. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is not necessarily the functionality piece, right? Aligning to some of the things that have come out from our perspective, um, you know, as a product vendor isn't so bad. The question is, what are the additional value adds and where are we going next? What, where, do, where's the next step going to be that we're going to have to think about? And so when we're thinking about things like, the cloud and we're thinking about running pipelines and ci cd you know what does DevSecOps look like when you're with the cloud how does zero trust play into that how do you secure your pipelines where are your jobs running so that they are the most secure and the fewest tokens and transactions and, and entry points can occur and and so you know our focus is starting to shift a little bit into some of those things to stay ahead of what comes next and where the next hole may be in our development processes as we make the shifts so uh, it, it keeps us on our toes as well yeah, I did a round table, I think, with the Platform One folks and some other people, and this kind of came up. So this is a really a, a good question, I think. Um, how, so you're in your debt, you're in your uh, development environment. How do you transition that? You know, what should that environment look like and transition it to production? Um, and and what are some of the challenges there that you, that you've encountered, um, Jerry? So, so where we are um, from a maturity standpoint, right? We've got automation with most of our systems from a CI perspective, and they integrate things like static code scanning, code qualities, and those sorts of things. But we're not at the maturity level where we're we're able to leverage them from an enforcement and a compliance perspective, right? And so, um, you know, that that as we as we uh, integrate that with our platform automation as part of our cloud migration. We're working on that maturity. So today we're still in this mindset where you know we allow developers to do their builds and work through those deployments and a certain level in the non-production environments. But then at some point, you know, we cut that off and then we transition that over to an operations deployment model. And that's really kind of what we want to move away from. You know, as as we can build more of this into into our pipelines. So. Great, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, yeah, you know, maybe perhaps I'll answer this from um, somewhat of a different perspective uh, or a different view on this. But you know, yes, obviously there was a lot of push to the left. We're pushing a lot more for sure on our developers to accomplish. Developers have had to take on quite a bit more as we move towards the DevSecOps methodology. Ultimately, they are deploying to production, right? So, so as we go through the process, we have certain we call control gates. Uh, in place uh, up to production. But then as, as they push, let's say containers uh, into production, the way that that's done, that's we, we've spent, so initially we spent so much time on the shift left and the development side of the house and the CI side of the house, so much time on that, that our CISO or chief information security officer said, well, hey, tell me more about production and, and what you're doing over there on the ops side. And so we've been focusing a lot more on that lately and, and actually specifically getting to, okay, great. We have, we can push containers. We can have container scanning happen through certain products out there, you name them. Uh, okay, great, but how do we get towards machine learning? How do we get towards 
learning trends, going towards behavioral patterns in your runtime environment, which we, you know, looking at the service mesh again to do that, connected to certain products to see, okay, what are things looking at looking like in production? Uh, and then how can we automate the process of quarantining something that isn't right? Like in the service mesh, you look at a pod, or if there's something wrong with a pod, quarantine it, right? So we're doing a lot of that right now to really focus more on the ops and production side of the house, but we're, we're really working to um, finish up defining some of that as we move towards our next cloud environment. Great, uh, Joel? Uh, it's hard to follow Chris's answer. I mean, that was, that was, <laughs> that was fantastic. I think the one thing I'll add is, you know, from, from my perspective, what I see happening a lot is the, you know, we keep hearing the terms platform and software factory, right? Those terms are thrown out a lot. And what they generate is a transparency. So regardless of where a shift left occurs or regardless of an ownership of something, we can at least see end to end how something got into that production environment. And we understand what the contributions were, what the scans were, what the risks were. Everything's in one place. And I, I see that bubbling up more and more into the, the, the mainline conversations because without it, uh, we're trying to connect the dots, right? And back to Jerry's point, he, he mentioned the word uh, maturity, right? Maturity is definitely one of those things that that we can can contrast like where we are with where we want to be when we've got visibility and transparency across that workflow. So uh, it's it's certainly something we're seeing more of a shift to. Great. Well, that actually is the topic of our poll question. So we'll get right into it. Um, and we'll put this up. Has ship left as a concept affected, affected your security practices? Yes, no, not sure. And we somehow got the technology back where we can have the panel vote. We we lost that for a while. I don't know how what happened. Sometimes things happen, you don't know why. Somebody did the development and they changed the button or something. So um, what, uh, Hana, what do we have? Okay, so this is relatively semi newish concept. It looks like, but interesting. Okay, let's uh, let's go to the next poll question. What does your DevSec option platform look like? Better collaboration between teams, faster time to market, improved overall productivity, and enhanced customer satisfaction. I guess you will need to rank the the biggest choice. All right. Um, interesting, Joel. Any any thoughts on that? Does that sound about right? Or yeah, it 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 does. I mean, we all have that that goal of a, a faster time to mission, right? We want to we want to have a better civilian experience we want all those things natively so uh the fastest way to get there to me strikes to, strikes me as better collaboration let's break those silos down and get things done uh and and you know uniquely enough that's not just a technology thing there's a lot of process baked into that that answer so uh, <laughs> no surprise to me great great uh let's go with the last one too In your opinion, how important is higher standards when it comes to DevSecOps software development? Right. All right, let's see, let's see what we have. Probably falls in line. Jerry, is that what you expected? Yeah, I think standards is sort of an interesting term, and it's one we're having a lot of debate about in our organization, um, because standard often is synonymous with mandates um, in organizations. And so we've started changing our nomenclature to talking about guardrails and gating conditions and those types of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, you absolutely agree that, you know, you you know, in our organization, we, we kind of sort of talk about it as we don't want the Baskin Robbins 31, right? We don't want 31 different ways of doing something, but one way of doing it probably isn't right either. And so that's the, you know, that's the dialogue we're working through in USDA is what are those two or three things that we can manage from a realistic yeah. perspective? 
Yeah, that, that actually was my next question. That seems to be the trend of different teams, slightly different, maybe a different even a product set. Uh, maybe maybe pull the thread on that a little bit more, Jerry, because it seems like how do you accommodate all these different groups, but keep the security that you care about, right? Yeah, and, and so one of the things we've done, um, it's probably been now seven or eight months, um, the uh, our uh, USDA ACIO uh, or CIO council, not to be confused with the federal CIO council, um, formed a cloud working group. And so we've got representation um, across all of our key mission areas. Um, and we've got also key representation from our departmental um, centers and, you know, security, our hosting folks and those sorts of things. Um, and, and, you know, for the first time since I've been in USDA, because I was in USDA left and came back, there, we're having discussions and, and dialogue at a level that we've never had before, right? And I think that's going to be key to our success on all these topics, because, you know, now we can talk about how do we implement, um, you know, like one of the things that um, the, the group that one of the groups that I'm leading, we just worked through an agreement around OS policy management and moving that from a um, GPO ADO based model to um, a model based upon configuration management tools, right? That is a huge step forward for us as an organization. Um, but it took a lot of getting people comfortable with that approach and why we're doing it and working through that. And that uh, that that working group is is the, you know was sort of the key to to allowing those conversations to happen. Right, Chris. On the topic of standards, right? So so and and, and I, I'm with you, Jerry, on that. You know, you say that word. Oh my gosh, I I, I can tell you stories. <laughs> and so we we've certainly used the term guardrails as well, um, we use that here. And I think that um, the 31, yeah, we've used that term as well, Baskin Robbins. And it's really interesting because this is something that, and perhaps a lot of you have experienced this as well, but in my experience in IT in general, you know, you, you wanna allow flexibility. You want to provide the customer with options and choices, but when it comes to what you have to maintain, you know, you gotta balance that out. And, and so, you know, I think that we're at a point now where you know, we're leveraging standards, but but we also want the customer to know that, hey, we're open to additional options, right? So like additional pipelines, right? Or, or perhaps even an additional software factor, depending on the circumstances. Uh, so we're, we're open to these things. We're open to different ways of doing things. We have this pipeline with these set of tools. Well, hey, if you would prefer this set of tools for your pipeline, we're open to those things, but we're also trying to limit that, you know, level of customization. Great. Uh, Joel? You know, when you talk about standards, you talk about the umbrellas, policy management, configuration management, compliance management, what, whatever umbrella you put in there, there, there's always kind of a best practices approach. And then there's everything else that we're talking about here that like, <laughs> we could start with point A, but there's going to be B through Z that come afterwards that we're going to have some situations where things apply, you know, differently. Uh, and so I think, you know, what I see kind of interesting is, is the, the ideas of centralizing and templatizing as much as possible at the core from, from our perspective, right? We want to provide people, okay, here, here's kind of an out-of-the-box best practice. Take it, do what you need to do with your configuration in order to spin that into what fits your organization correctly. And it covers everything and it allows your expansion uh, where needed, right? So it's one of those things that we look at is, is what can we find as a best practice? And then how can we make sure that it's evolvable in any and every situation? Thank you. Um, well, I can ask questions all day. If anybody out there, including the esteemed Jason Miller, want to ask a question, Jason can actually come on live if you'd like. It wouldn't bother me at all. Um, and uh, anybody wants to put something in the chat, we'll be happy. We'll be happy to address it. Uh, we're getting. We still got a little time here, so um, you still have time to squeeze them in. Um, my next question is: um, Is security scanning grows from static to dynamic? Dependency, fuzz, secrets, detection, and more. What impacts do you expect from your agency, from your vendors? You know, we we're, we're not in the stage, hopefully, where we have we develop the whole system, we submit it to the CISO, and then uh, you know it fails, and we get like 2,000 you know ways it failed. Uh, how how is this all changing uh, 
you know, that we're correcting issues along the way in that two week development cycle. Maybe start off with you, Jerry. Um, so I'm going to probably take this from a um, not necessarily a new development perspective. I'm going to talk to it about from a legacy perspective, right? Because I think that's one of the challenges that we're working through with our on-prem um, implementations. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, we've got this, these uh, sets of systems um, and they, they're built, they're running. But as we, you know, continue to layer these additional processes and scanning and those sorts of things, um, how do we work through getting budget approval for doing those things, right? Because these, these tools are all great, they uncover things, but when they do uncover them, then somebody's got to fund the going and fixing those things, and working them, right? So um, how do you work through that? And particularly in a time where I know from the dialogue with our business folks, they, their budget for doing DME continues to get crunched, right? And so there's this, this, uh, this real balancing act that's occurring between all these processes and mandates that are coming down and just the mission's ability to deliver new capabilities. Thank you. Yeah, you're right about that. Uh, Chris? Yeah, as we, as we shift, not really shift, but as we add, as we add the DAST piece of this from SAS. So, so SAS has been a big thing. We've been, I think we've gotten pretty good at that in the last couple of years. Uh, the DAS piece of it, you know, we're picking up uh, and we've been, you know, involved with that for some time, but maybe not as mature uh, in doing that. But, you know, I think that um, that recently uh, it's part of the conversation I mentioned earlier where the CISO said, hey, what about, you know, production or what about ops? Well, DAS, you know, of course, can help us to test things from in a runtime environment. Maybe not necessarily production. You could do it in a non-prod-like environment. Use your DAS, your you know your black box testing, right, and all that. And so, of course, there are tools that can help us with that. But I really think that to, to Jerry's point on, well, once you do that, what do you do with that information, and who's going to to address it? And, and I, I think that's why we're looking heavily uh, at well, how can we leverage the, the machine learning? As I mentioned before, I'm not going to drop the name of a product, but we're looking at something that does connect with that service mesh to look at the health of the overall cluster. Um, Kubernetes, you know, it's a popular thing, right? But, but ultimately a cluster uh, to determine trends, you know, over the course of weeks or months, what does normal behavior look like? And then if it detects something that's abnormal, then it should automatically isolate that pod. I mean, those are just some of the things that we're looking at to try to automate that because yes, uh, otherwise, you're getting a you know a lot of stuff sent to maybe a team of people that have to address whatever it is that the DAST tooling may may find. Great, Joel. Well, it's it's interesting. I keep hearing DAST, right? Uh, we we've been as a we've we've talked with a lot of folks for a long time about secure and what it looks like for every environment, and SAST has long been the top conversation. Uh, that has dramatically shifted within the last five to six months, whereas DAST has now become the dominant conversation. Um, it, it's, it's definitely at the top of the list. If you kind of come down from there, license um, compliance and dependency scanning fit that with all the SBOM conversations that we've been having lately. So those have bubbled up. But if I look just below DAST, our conversations are focused on security dashboards, trending and vulnerability management, centralizing that, right? A lot of folks want to know, just like you're saying, Chris, like how in the world do we take all this stuff and put it in one place and make sure we get everything that's P1 out of here, right? Where, where's the critical stuff? Where's the, how do we make sure we do that across the different scanners? And how do we get a snapshot view of this? Uh, and that is definitely at the top of the conversations lately uh, from my perspective. Great, thank you for that. We, ha we have a question um, from Jason Miller, Federal News Network. And uh, who's on the hot seat? Oh, it's you, Chris. Uh, can Chris talk more about the move to Platform One and Cloud One? Uh, what impact will it have on Transcom IT modernization efforts? Good question. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, oh man, yeah, I could go many different ways on this. It's, it's certainly been a substantial, um, amount of effort to to determine you know what goes what stays um, 
how, what does it mean even from a human resource perspective? You know, I mean, we go, I could go on and on, but, but really I think the big thing on more of a positive side of the house is that from our perspective, we are a large enough organization that, that the cloud one can give us, uh, they can provide us with capability that we're struggling with today, you know, honestly. And so, you know, there are some things that we maintain in our current environment and sometimes it's a challenge. And I think that in some cases we have overly customized to meet our customers' needs. And so Cloud One, uh, they've really more so standardized than us. And so they're able to really maintain certain things fairly quickly, it looks like. And so, for example, they have certain tools uh, in place that they maintain and we won't even have to worry about. Right, so so Cloud One can cover the infrastructure as a service side of the house, and and that's okay, and they have certain products in there, uh, and we're going to try to connect the platform side of the house. So really, I think for us, it's I think we're excited about it. I think that for us, we're going to be able to focus more so on what we're good at, and I feel like what we're good at is the platform side of the house, and and we're going to really work with Cloud One to um to handle the infrastructure side of the house. So from our perspective, I believe that it's actually helping us to remove silos. Um, so I, I can touch more on that if, if needed. I, again, I could go on with all the different things that we got going on uh, with that transition. Great, well, maybe we can facilitate a conversation with you and Jason and, and can take it offline. Uh, we, we've got just a few minutes left. Uh, It'd be great. Like, what did we not cover that you're addressing uh, in your own organizations, and or, or even like, what are you what are you working on the rest of the year um, within your organizations that you the the audience might find interesting? Uh, Gary. So um, one of the things that it kind of hits on the topic that Joel was just talking about with vulnerability management, right? So. Um, On-prem, on one of our big challenges is kind of our state of the art right now is we get copies of spreadsheets of our vulnerabilities and then we have to reconcile that with what's updated. And then, you know, so we, we, you know, quite frankly, spend as much time with our process related to vulnerability management as we do actually fixing vulnerabilities. And so, um, again, without going into details about the specific tool that we're looking at, we are really, you know, we found a tool that we believe as we go forward is going to eliminate a lot of that process part and allow our operations teams to focus all of their time on exactly what Joel was talking about, right? Is looking at the vulnerabilities, getting the priorities knocked down and spending all of their time doing that um, and sort of moving that to the left. And that, that's one of the things we're very, very excited about because as it, with an organization the size we are, um, vulnerability management is a huge, huge part of our operational footprint. Great, thank you. Chris? Uh, yeah, uh, one thing uh, I didn't touch on here. So we're we're looking to, so the risk management framework, RMEF, is uh, something that uh, we've been adhering to. Of course, the government, I believe, has been adhering to for quite some time, shifting from DICAP to RMF and everything that comes with that, trying to meet all the controls. And the, the current way that we, that we do this and that we've been doing for some time is that a program, a program manager and, and all the whole team will go ahead and, and say, okay, hey, here you go, security team, we've adhered to your controls. And then the security team will get around to it whenever that may be and say, no, you haven't, you didn't do this, this, and this, and they send it back and it goes back and forth and it's, it's, it's a challenge. And so what we wanna do uh, leveraging the, you know, a standard software factory and runtime environment using DevSecOps methodologies and all that is achieve a continuous ATO. Uh, something that I brought up a couple of years ago and I was literally told uh, that's impossible. Uh, and, and so, and so but, but we're seeing that it's becoming more of a thing in the DOD. And we're seeing, so, you know, Platform One, of course, accomplished that via their party bus. These terms are funny, I'm sorry, guys, but party bus. And then Kessel Run was able to accomplish that. Space Camp was able to accomplish that. Oh, and then uh, an organization team, Bespin, uh, has accomplished that as well. So we have government or federal DOD entities that have done this. So there's no reason why we can't do it. And so thankfully, we've, we've, I've gotten the, uh, the community on board and we're going towards that. And we're moving towards achieving that continuous ATO. But it is, it is a challenge because you do have security experts that are familiar with the traditional way of doing things. So you have to have people that understand DevSecOps, understand the software factor, all these things I just talked about, but you also need them to understand RMF. 
And, and, and those people don't want to understand RMF because it's like, come on, let's move <laughs> forward, right? But you have to so that you can connect the dots for those people that may not understand how we're accomplishing the controls or the intent of the controls via DevSecOps methodology. You have to say, look, your way of doing things was this, here's how it is over here. So that's, that's what we're going through right now. And um, I'm optimistic that we'll be successful. Chris, I'm glad you brought this up with compliance with these policies. If you don't do it, if you don't bake it in from the start, it's just going to be it, I, uh, another football term, a drive killer. You know, you're going to want to deliver some software and then you got to redo the whole thing. It's it's just not worth it. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I'm at the end here, Joel. You you know, you got to wrap up the panel. No pressure or anything. But uh, can you put a bow tie on this panel for us? Well, I think, you know, if we if we look at everything that we've been talking about and where we're going next, um, you know, one of our goals here is automation. We want to keep driving automation. So when we've been talking about remediation. What are the next steps in remediation? How do we drive semi-automated, fully automated? Like, what are the levels of automation we can provide around vulnerability remediation, right? We want to make this easier. We want to make this more seamless as time goes on. Uh, I mentioned SBOM generation, right? We, we, we want to make sure we automate that as much as possible. Concepts like release verification. What does that look like to make sure that the things we got from open source and, and oh my goodness, there's a whole other can. I don't want to open it right now, but managed and supported open source, right? And this whole world that, of and, and all the pieces we're pulling in, are they, did they come from where they should have? Did they, did, you know, include what they, they should have included? Uh, were there contributions from questionable areas? All those types of things are on our mind. We're trying to drive more automation around, say, auditability for those things as well. So, you know, how do we make sure that all those pieces are captured so that everything we talked about today becomes uh, not just an easy button, right? But at least it drives some sort of a foundational best practice for us to adhere to those guidelines and those guardrails that I heard so much about today. Great, great. Well, thank you, Joel. And thank you, Jerry, Chris, and Joel, uh, for this panel. I learned a lot. And uh, now I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Alyssa. Thank you, Tom and panelists for that great insight. It was always great to hear from you guys. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our attendees and our partners over at Good Lab for partnering with us today. Um, it was truly a great um, summit full of lots of insight. Before everyone goes, we would like to put up one last poll question. Um, if you answered all of your polls today and would like ATARC to send you over a CV credit certification, um, please answer that. Super easy. We'll send it right to your email. Um, so fill out that poll for us. Um, but that is everything we have for today. So we look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you. Have a great one.